Why does it need to take three years to put a bench in a park, to plant a median, to activate a vacant lot? How do we change it? How do we not have to rely on every dollar to, from developers to, to do these sorts of projects? I don't know. It's, it's sort of exciting. You know, I think communities were just ready to say we can do this too. Welcome to I Made It in San Diego, voice of San Diego's podcast about the stories behind the region's businesses, the big and the small, and the people who made them what they are. I'm Kinsey Moreland, and in this week's show, a story about Elisa Goldman, a landscape architect who's helped design and build several local community-driven improvement projects and outdoor educational spaces for kids. Elisa grew up in a suburb of Philadelphia, where she caught the environmentalist bug early. By high school, she already knew she wanted to major in environmental studies in college. It was also in high school that she first got interested in working with teams of community volunteers on improvement projects. She traveled to Costa Rica to build trails and a playground for a small town there. After high school, she went to North Carolina State University, where she signed up for a study abroad program and went to Guatemala in the Dominican Republic to help build medical facilities and other amenities for a small community. It wasn't until her senior year at North Carolina State that Elisa was introduced to landscape architecture and planning. I had no idea what it was. I just found it so fascinating that we could actually design the built environment to connect people back to the natural world as well as improve, you know, our ecological systems. So after college, I took about a year off to figure out what I wanted to do. I did environmental education in a um, environmental education center in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania. And it was during that time that we had a lot of inner city kids come out who have never seen nature. You know, they were excited and scared and it was a really moving experience and it was during that time that I realized okay design designing space and bringing nature to the daily lives of people uh, was a was a true passion of mine. Elisa graduated college but immediately went back to get her master's in landscape architecture. It was during that time that she became obsessed with designing outdoor educational and play environments for kids. She studied with a guy named Robin Moore, one of the leading experts in outdoor learning environments, and was one of the first employees at his natural learning initiative. She was never interested in designing traditional playgrounds. So if you're picturing a park with a big plastic play structure plopped in the middle of it, that's not what she's into. Elisa designed spaces that encourage kids to dig in the dirt, climb on rocks, explore creek beds, and really get engaged with nature. Often we see... uh playgrounds where they're fenced in and all the vegetation is on the outside of the playground and there's no shade. And to me, that just never made sense. Like, why would, let's put the vegetation inside the playground. Let's let the kids play with it, especially early childhood, really all the way through elementary school. Children love to do mud pies and dig in the dirt and play with loose parts and do dramatic play. And play structures don't always offer that opportunity. Not to mention, play structures are really expensive. You could spend (laughs) hundreds of thousands of dollars on a rubberized surface, a huge play structure that really is only tapping into one of the needs or a few of the needs Mm -hmm. of children with regards to um, play value. I knew that there was a better way to design play spaces. And uh, it's not that play structures are bad, but I think there's a very strategic way to integrate nature and nature-based play into our... um, into our parks or in our playgrounds and our schools. And to me, a place, one play structure is not enough. Elisa graduated in 2002 and moved out to San Diego. The city's economy was booming at the time. She got a job quickly, but the first firm she worked for was not a good fit. The upside to her lackluster day job, though, was that it motivated her to look for more fulfilling volunteer work. That's how she met James Hubble, the famed artist and architect who's Unique style of architecture is revered worldwide. So I had heard about Jim Hubble in grad school in North Carolina, that he was this organic architect and had these beautiful buildings and mosaics, but didn't really know too much. And when I first came out here, I was working for a firm that just their missions didn't align with my missions. I was there for about a year and a half. I got great AutoCAD skills. (laughs) Got to do one good, interesting project there, but it was a lot of um, suburban track development. Mm. Yeah, did not. Yeah, it 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 didn't fill my interests. 
um, my passions. And so during that time, I started to, I was very interested in uh, permaculture, sustainable design, children's environment. So I just started, you know, researching and uh, Jim Hubble, the Hubble properties were going to have their open house. I was like, oh, that sounds so great. I'd love to go up and see his properties. One of those father's yearly Father's Day ones. I went up and I met Drew Hubble and um, some other people up there. And I received a flyer for La Rosa Blanca, which was a three or three day workshop down in El Colegio La Esperanza down in Mexico, where you got to work side by side with Jim on the school environment. And so I drove down with Jim and we just I told him my background and his background, and it was just an instant connection. Uh, met wonderful people at this workshop, and I don't know if it was on the way home or what, but he's like, look, I really need help running these volunteer work days. We go down every month. Your pay will double each time you go down. I was getting paid zero, so, you know, zero times zero, zero. <laughs> so it was clearly a volunteer thing, uh, but for me, it was an opportunity that I definitely wanted. I didn't have very many responsibilities at the time. I was a young professional, no kids. But it was fun. everything is a good learning experience. And I was just I was able to fulfill those needs by my work now with um, with Jim and going down to Mexico and leading. We did monthly work days. So I helped uh, revive the garden down there and build in the garden, help teach people mosaicing and really saw that um, facility grow. And I actually took over running uh, La Rosa Blanca for many years. So I uh, just have a very. um uh, strong and grateful relationship with Jim Hubble and to this day we still you know we still try to stay in contact and and partner together when possible but that really got me into the community building side of things. Eventually Elisa ditched her job designing suburban landscapes and scored a new job with Spurlock Poyer Landscape Architects, one of the most prestigious landscape architecture firms in San Diego. She quickly worked her way up to management and worked on some of the firm's biggest projects including a park in the East Village that was finally built a few years ago. I was able to see several projects through, one including Fault Line Park in the East Village, which was just one of the most amazing projects that I've worked on. Um, what did you like about that project? Uh, we engaged community, which was great, and we... Because that project started way back. Oh, yeah. A long, long ago. 2006, maybe? Uh-huh. It was the first time, my first time working with what was you know, CCD mm-hmm. at that time, uh, seeing East Village. I mean, East Village was not transformed by any means then, you know, <laughs> so really seeing uh, that community change and wanting to bring positive um, design and, and spaces into their into the neighborhood. Uh, and another wonderful thing about that project, and, and I really thank Spurlock Poyer, Landscape Architects, for encouraging me, but for integrating... Um, play in uh, play the connection of play in nature Um, so it wasn't just a traditional play structure but how do we really have it feel that it's emerging from the context of the site Um, and I just had a lot of fun uh, just working on the design and the community and the processing and oh even the political design is reflective of the fact that it's on a a fault line a fault yeah so we actually went we, we looked at place for the design concept and Everything that came out of the design somehow went back to place and uh, and the fault line and uh, the faults that run through uh, Southern California and San Diego, the skylines, the views, what was underneath the ground, above the ground. And it was just an amazing project. I left before um, before it was built because with the downturn in the economy, it uh, it went on a pause. And when it came <laughs> back to get built, I still have a very close relationship with what's now Spurlock Landscape Architects. Um, And it's just always had a really wonderful place in my heart. Elisa became a mom while she was at Spurlock. Her second child came right as the economy tanked in 2008. So she decided to leave her career and focus on raising her children for a while. After a few years, though, she started getting the itch to get back to work. She started by volunteering and got on the board of San Diego Children in Nature, a nonprofit volunteer organization that works to reconnect children with the outdoors. As a board member, she started talking to local groups about the importance of outdoor space and involving local communities and helping to create it. She also took her first training in community-led placemaking, grassroots projects where local residents work together to do quick, affordable improvements to the urban landscape, like turn an empty lot into a community garden. 
At that same time, Elisa got involved with the San Diego Gathering Place program, a partnership between the San Diego Foundation, a Reason to Survive Arts nonprofit, and the Pomegranate Center, a nonprofit known for its success in training people to help communities successfully complete placemaking projects. She says the Pomegranate Center training she got through that program changed her life. Pomegranate Center is a nonprofit out of Seattle, Washington, that was founded by Malenko Matanovic. And he is internationally known for his uh, facilitation and community building skills. So he can go into very, very tense communities, be able to draw consensus and what we, we refer to as creative collaboration, get people on board, the naysayers, the, the residents, the professionals, giving everyone a voice in the project, but in a way that the project doesn't get derailed or installed because there's too many voices, which we've seen. We've seen that happen on many public projects and private projects. Um, so drawing consensus is a big one. So they have a really strong presence in the Pacific Northwest, working with municipalities, working with First Nation tribes on uh, different sorts of projects, mostly built gathering place projects, but also um, master planning and um, future planning for how two cities can grow together, you know, side by side. So he's really been able to expand it. His background is a, as an artist, so he also does beautiful work. He taught me how to, the pomegranate method training essentially teaches you how to wire a project for success, how to have a clear idea, how to create a convening group of stakeholders to guide the project, how to lead a com effective community meeting so you get true input um, and actually get progress, how to um, create a schedule and a budget that's going to work, and then how to bring the community back to actually build it. So it's not about volunteer recruitment. It's about true community engagement. We're not just asking volunteers to come paint for a day or do something for a day, but they are creating and transforming space in their communities. And I went to the training and the training was going to parallel the um, Butterfly Park project that was a gathering place in National City. And the partner on that was Olive Wood Gardens. So it was Olive Wood, San Diego Foundation, Arts and Pomegranate Center. So as I was getting the training, which taught me all of these really wonderful skills on true community engagement, I got to see everything in action from convening group to early success projects through the actual four-day community build um, to see how the pomegranate methodology works. And it was just an instant hit. Like I had done this sort of work before, but never had like these official skills, mm -hmm. never had official facilitation skills. Like how do you run a community meeting to make everyone feel that their voices are heard and not have that one person, the grandstander stand up and take over, derail the meeting. And it was an instant click. It was like everything that I had worked on up into that point just came together and I was able to get the skills to really go out and make these projects happen. As part of the San Diego Gathering Place program, Elisa also helped design and build the Manzanita Gathering Space in City Heights. It's a really nice little outdoor space with seating, shade, and art that overlooks a canyon. So we worked with uh, San Diego Canyonlands and Azalea Park, a wonderful community of volunteers and people passionate about their neighborhood spaces, and we were able to convert this really negatively utilized space. It was actually part of the city uh, right-of-way. No one was really maintaining it very well. There was lots of drug use happening. The community couldn't even get to it. However, it provided a cut through on um, to six different schools in the area. So what could go from the neighborhoods through this nature trail to the surrounding schools really couldn't be used because there were sort of encampments and just not positive drug, not positive uses happening. Mm -hmm. And so we worked with the community, we engaged them using the pomegranate um, methodology, we engaged the community to take down the fence, which was huge. There was a barb and razor wire fence that blocked this area from the community directly adjacent to it. And we thought the community would be like, oh no, we can't take down the fence. They're gonna come into our neighborhood. But everyone was on board, we took down the fence. And over a three to four month period, we worked with the community to design and transform this space into what's now the Manzanita Gathering Place that really touches on local ecology, the surrounding neighborhood and culture. We had a group of about 35 youth from um, One of Monroe Clark, from mm -hmm. Monroe Clark Middle School in the area. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I firmly believe that we transformed not only the space, but the neighborhood. Her work on projects like the Manzanita Gathering Place in City Heights and Butterfly Park in National City, plus the other volunteer work and lectures she was doing, caught the attention of Rick Richardson, the CEO of Child Development Associates, a nonprofit agency that provides child care and development services throughout San Diego County. The agency had won a grant to help transform the outdoor space of a preschool it ran in Chula Vista, and Rick wanted Elisa to come up with the design. She was happy volunteering, though, and didn't necessarily want to start her own firm. But she also couldn't say no to the project. I had never thought that I wanted my own practice. <laughs> it just wasn't on my radar, not that as interested in starting a business. You know, I was a mother and I wanted to not have that stress of keeping a business going. But as I started to do my volunteer work and people kept coming to me, mainly one of my clients who is still my client to this day, had a child development center and he was like, I've seen you present. I'm really interested in your work. Do you design children's environments? And I said, well, I do. <laughs> I was like, okay, what do I need to do to actually start a business, get the business license and really starting from scratch just for that one project. That one project turned into two, turned into three. Did you have to figure out all the stuff like um, billing and you know, did you have to set up a, get a business license right yeah, away? And I, yeah, how to get a business license. I got, uh, I think, business startups for dummies. <laughs> I just, I didn't hey. have the, I had the background in like project management and budgeting through my work with Spurlock because mm -hmm. by the time I had left Spurlock, um, I was running my own projects and part of the, ma the, the management team for the office and seeing, you know, what comes in, what goes out, how do you staff things? So I had that, but no, I had never run my own, you know, my own company. So, so what were the, yeah, I mean, you bought this book. Um, what was one of the biggest challenges? What were some of the biggest challenges that came up early on in those first projects? Uh, understanding what I could do with insurance, <laughs> what I could do, like what was the liability I was getting myself into, right? So Stand maintenance and liability. Clauses, yeah. huh? <laughs> so that, but uh, luckily I came from, like I, I had a good background and I had a good, you know, family support that could help me navigate that. Um, and then really understanding like, business projections like where do I want this business to go do I want this business to go what is my target audience and my target audience are those that are most in need that don't always have the money you know and so they're grant funded and so that was really challenging and it still is to this day you know how do we remain accessible to the communities and organizations that need us the most when we also have to make a living Elisa called her new business Rooted in Place and decided she wanted to focus her landscape architecture firm on serving nonprofits that want to improve outdoor spaces. It was 2012, and for the first year of business, it was just her. The first outdoor space she designed for a child development associate was a hit. The play area includes a mural, an art wall, fun sand and water features, native plants, and a children's garden. There were a few hiccups during the build out, but the project ultimately ended up winning some big awards. It was great. So I actually produced a schematic design for them. Okay. And then they had a general contract build it, okay. um, which was interesting. I learned how much I really do enjoy and value the traditional landscape architecture process of going from schematic design to design development into construction drawings into construction administration. Um, and this project was a little different, but I realized that that's really how nonprofits, especially smaller nonprofits, um, they needed a different model. They don't always have the funding to go through a full landscape architecture um, process, which could take years and requires a lot of permitting. And so anyway, so I saw that happen. Some things were installed not exactly the way I wanted them. And I was like, okay, I need to be on site when these things get installed. And it, that project was really interesting because there was um, a piece of property um, that sat just adjacent to the main play and learning area that they just didn't have funding to do as part of the first phase. And so my thought was, let's make that phase two and see if we can get a grant to make that uh, a nature, like a nature trail or nature habitat. And I was able to bring together some people that I met through sort of what we call the Hubble bubble, the Jim Hubble <laughs> world. And we called ourselves the Gartners. And we took on this project um, to transform this. It was, there was nothing there. It was um, just a blank slate with some trees and always flooded. 
uh, into um, an outdoor learning area for uh, for the children there, ages three to five. Uh, the executive director, Rick Richardson, um, and I apologize, his title is no longer executive director, CEO and president. Um, he is just a go-getter with funding and got a grant for about $42,000. So the Gartners, which um, I would say I predominantly led, we did students and everyone volunteered their time. We came up with a a concept plan that then we developed um, into a plan they could use for funding and implementation. So once the funding came, then they brought me back to organize a community build uh, to implement that. And it was just fantastic. I, it's, it's essentially they have a bioswale on the campus, an outdoor learning area. They call it an exploration station. And it's all native plants. So in the spring, it is just a beautiful botanical display that is literally the black, the backdrop to this early childhood center. And early childhood centers are like our school environments, especially our public schools. There's not a lot of emphasis on creating a healthy outdoor environment. And so this has shade and loose parts nature play and music play and sand kitchens and mud kitchens. And now this nature trail that we call the Habitat Garten, lowercase g, capital A-R-T, lowercase e-n. So it's the Hilltop Habitat Garten. (laughs) Uh, So there's mosaics and uh, really beautiful bird blinds and it was it was just a fantastic project that really made one complete um, child development center, which has won a couple awards now through ULI, um, ASLA had given it an award. And that was really one of the first projects that, um, yeah, I got to see it at completion. Elisa could have kept building up her business from there. Projects just kept popping up. But instead, she pivoted. She was offered an opportunity to work for the city of San Diego to try to figure out how to break down the bureaucracy so more placemaking projects could be built. It sounded like a perfect job and a big idea. It was a signature proposal from a new mayor who was promising to transform the city. So she started talking to Bob Vilner about his big idea. When we come back, Elisa takes the job at the city of San Diego's newly created Civic Innovation Lab how the unpredictable politics surrounding the venture eventually got it shut down, forcing Elisa to change course once again. Voice of San Diego podcasts are sponsored in part by a proud supporter of Make-A-Wish. As a nonprofit news organization, Voice of San Diego depends on our members, foundations, and sponsors like Make-A-Wish. We are very grateful for all of our supporters, and we recognize their support in our shows. If you crave adventure, love the outdoors, and welcome a challenge, then the Make-A-Wish Trailblaze Challenge is for you. The Trailblaze Challenge is a one-day, 28-mile endurance event along the Pacific Crest Trail. It's open to all levels from novice to advanced outdoor enthusiasts. Visit www.trailblazechallengesd.org to learn more. Proceeds benefit Make-A-Wish. Challenge yourself in 2018, meet new people, and make a difference for children with critical illnesses. Voice of San Diego podcasts are also sponsored in part by a proud supporter of Monarch School. Monarch School educates students impacted by homelessness, helping them develop hope for a future with the necessary skills and experience for personal success. Monarch is holding its annual fundraiser, Building Bright Futures, on April 26th. Join event chairs Tracy Hoffman and recent Hall of Fame inductee Trevor Hoffman at this event. Find out more at monarchschools.org backslash events. And if you like Voice of San Diego's work and want to become a sponsor too, contact development at voiceofsandiego.org. Hey, welcome back to I Made It in San Diego. I'm Kinsey Moreland.
The City of San Diego's Civic Innovation Lab began in 2013 as the Incubator for Civic Imagination, a pet project of then-Mayor Bob Filner. The incubator was designed to do the kind of work Elisa was already doing, quicker, more affordable, neighborhood-driven urban development projects in historically marginalized and underserved communities. Just a few months after the project was launched, though, Vilner resigned amid charges of sexual harassment and assault. Looking back, it's clear that the project died with his resignation. But at the time, interim mayor Todd Gloria kept the project going, renaming it the Civic Innovation Lab and hiring a small team of urbanists who reported to the city's planning director at the time, Bill Fulton. Elisa was aware of how precarious the position at the Civic Innovation Lab was because of the politics, but she took the job anyway. I said yes because the job description was like a dream job come true. <laughs> yeah. And I had never seen it written in a job description exactly what I wanted to be doing. And I felt that it was, I could make a lot, help make change in San Diego, in the city of San Diego. And, um, and I felt that I was qualified for it. So I wanted to do that. It had its issues, but I just plugged through and I mean, they were political issues. <laughs> um, <laughs> Plugged through and did the work that I set out to do and made wonderful contacts and saw firsthand what the real issues were inside of the city, outside of the city, with the com community organizations. Um, what were the biggest challenges? Why was it hard to do these placemaking projects? I had really come to understand that our development services was geared toward developers who had money, not toward communities that wanted to make their own change. And I just heard over and over again these community organizations that wanted to transform a median in their neighborhood or a corner or a bus stop, and there was not an avenue for them to do that. The Civic Innovation Lab was full-time and then some, mm -hmm. um, and it was a lot to do once we found out. So Civic Innovation Lab, I think my first day was like January something of 2014. By March of 2014, I believe it was, we we pretty much knew we were not going to be, when do they release the initial budget? It was March or April. Mm -hmm. um, we found out that we were not going to be funded. We were pretty much told we could work until June. Um, Did you, were you guys able to, or were you personally able to achieve anything in that short amount of time? Like, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of you learned a lot in this, you know. Yes, learned a tremendous amount. And I, I was working at this time on um, with Groundwork San Diego through the Civic Innovation Lab on the uh, Choyas Creek uh, gathering place, educational gathering place, which was at 47th and Castana. It was one of the, so it's very interesting, the executive director of Choyas Creek had been coming to me for, I don't know, a year or so talking to me about this this lot that was the like highest crime lot in Southeast San Diego, in Lincoln Park, gang violence, dumping ground, community didn't even want to walk through the property because there was so much gang activity happening. There were murders there. You know, there were alleged rapes there. There was all sorts of negative activity, a lot of drug use. And I really didn't know how to help her and then when we went to the Civic Innovation Lab and we realized we were looking for community projects, that one was just ripe and ready to go. They had had funding. And so I, that became my project um, at the Civic Innovation Lab. And I was committed to helping this organization, helping this community take back this space. And so even after we found out that we were defunded and my last day was going to be June 30th and the build for that project was something like June 27th, 28th, 29th and 30th that I was gonna do it. Um, and we did, we did a four day build. It became much more challenging once the city, once it became known in the city that we weren't gonna be defunded, people were less likely to help things work out. And um, there really was no mayoral support on getting this project completed. So it was a lot of on the ground work to make it happen. And, um, and we did, and it turned out to be an amazing project. And since now, it's uh, another organization has taken it over because it was just too much for um, groundwork to... One of the things that the city requires is that the community organization that wants to initiate a project has to sign off on maintenance and liability in, indefinitely, in perpetuity. So for a small community organization, that's really challenging. Um, most often don't have the capacity. They may have the capacity to help 
get the community together to transform the space, but then the city didn't want to do anything to help maintain it, even though it was their it was their property that was mm-hmm. not being maintained. So it was actually City of San Diego property that was not being maintained and was a huge liability in the, from my perspective in the community. So just recently, a new organization, I uh, can't remember the name off the top of my head, um, took it over now. It's a native plant educational demonstration site. So oh, it's nice. really, it's, it's exciting to see it take on a second life past the original Gathering Place project. So yeah, I worked up until my last day. I went into the office. I did a four-day build, worked, you know, 13, 14 hours a day during that, my last four days at the Civic Innovation Lab, went in, cleaned out my office and was done. And I'm not going to lie, it was the most stressful job I've ever had, not because of the workload, but because of the politics. Every day were we going to get escorted out, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. So that was really stressful. So it was a big relief. Um, And my clients were waiting for me and they said, let's get you back. We're ready. We need you. We have another project. And that started what pretty project? much right away. Uh, the Barrio, uh, same uh, Child Development Associates. Okay. Um, their their next center, the Barrio Logan Child Development Center, was up, and then they had another one sort of in the pipeline they needed uh, work on. Got another project up in Carlsbad, and so the rest of 2014 was uh, really focusing on rooted in place work. I got. I, I don't know if at that point, like I did the website and the logo. I can't remember when this all happened. And just sort of went full steam with Rooted. It was during that year that I was actually diagnosed, found out that I had um, the BRCA mutations, BRCA1 and BRCA2, oh. which are the genetic mutations, where, which uh, are a, I had a very high, high in the 80s and 90s percent risk of getting breast and ovarian cancer, not only in my lifetime, but in my 40s, and I was 37. And so it actually came at a time that the closing of the Civic Innovation Lab and finding out those results that I knew I would have to slow down a bit anyway and take care of it. So um, I actually uh, elected to have a volunteer um, mastectomy and total hysterectomy, so ovaries and everything. So that sort of took uh, my steam <laughs> steam out of my sails for quite a bit, but the work kept coming in. And it was 2000, beginning of 2015 when I was recovering from my mastectomy that I brought on my first um, uh, helper uh, to help. She was a recent graduate and she was absolutely wonderful and helped me uh, get some of these projects sort of um, out the door. And so. So can we talk started. about the finance side of this? Were you, you know, before you, um, for, before the stint in the Civic Innovation Lab, um, did you make any money? Like, were you pay, be able to pay yourself? A, uh, a little bit. Okay. Like, I'm very fortunate. My husband is a, you know, um, he has a full-time full time job. He's a professional at a startup in San Diego. Um, so my income wasn't, it was, it, our bills could be paid without my income. Yeah. You know, we didn't have a savings or, you know, couldn't necessarily go on vacation. But um, so the lo- the money that I was bringing in before the Civic Innovation Lab was just, it wasn't, it wasn't a tremendous amount. You know, it paid the bills, paid for childcare, you know, wasn't really thinking about business development at that point. It wasn't until after the Civic Innovation Lab that I started thinking about, okay, how can I make this financially sustainable? And, and we're still did... working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Fast forward now, you, you built up your business a little mm-hmm. bit. You got more into it. Did you like do trainings? Did you ever get um, investments or did you ever like so we wanted to do more of like the social impact and went to some of the accelerators and startups. And what we really had a hard time figuring out is a lot of these tech startup, they're most looking into tech and they're looking for returns. And how do you give, how do you quantify the returns you're getting on these community projects? And I don't know if you can financially right off the bat. I think there's a financial, there's definitely um, a financial benefit in these communities and for local vendors um, and for local stores and retail. I think there's a benefit in making places more accessible to walking and playing and social gathering. I think you're building social capacity in these sorts of um, projects, but we have not well, we've never been approached by a vendor or have not been able to get really the assistance we needed to, or not the vendor, a, um, a investor, to figure out who would be inve- in, interested in investing in something like this. Um, it needs to be someone that doesn't, it's, it doesn't, I don't want to say can't make a lot of money on it, but that's not what it's about. 
-hmm. It's a social benefit. And part of that is we are really trying to be true to our mission and not just taking on any project. Um, Our clients are community-oriented nonprofits and educational nonprofits who are grant-funded and donor-funded. And so how... And it's, it's, it's sort of like twofold. You know, you have to educate these organizations why, what you can provide for them, how you can help them, and why it's important for them to spend their limited um, income and capital on this sort of work that we do. Uh, and then also help them figure out how they can raise money for it and how they can raise enough money to pay, you know, to pay for our services. And so we've looked at all sorts of business models. You know, should we be nonprofit? Should we be for benefit? Should we be a social enterprise? And so we've been leaning more toward the for benefit social enterprise model. Um, but it's still challenging. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we are surviving and getting by and we have a wonderful office and we have a great collaborative setting. But, you know, uh, funding has waves. And if our... Pro- clients aren't getting funded, then, you know, we can't be hired. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's still challenging and we're still working on that. Um, so tactical urbanism, placemaking, those words, you know, as a journalist, I don't remember really seeing them much until, I don't know, maybe Mm 2013-ish. Um, So it seems like you kind of hit your stride right at the right time when these were ideas that were just getting a lot more attention across the world. Yeah. So how, like, educate me. What, how did that, like, how did these two concepts really come into their own and start becoming a thing? So I don't know why that two, this 2012 through 14 were just, this was really getting momentum. You know, parking day happened. We had our first parklet in San Diego. And I, you know, communities, I think that communities were sort of tired of waiting. They were waiting for improvements and, you know, to happen in their community and trying to go through city council and trying to go through governance and realizing it was really hard. And why do they, why does it need to take three years to, you know, put a, put a bench in a park, to plant a median, to, activate a you know a vacant lot for you know something like the Defair in 44 you know where you know they brought in some uh, microeconomic vendors and local vendors to activate a vacant parking lot and it was gaining momentum oh we also had the rad lab who did the courtyard and all of these started to emerge around the same time and people started to take note is saying okay like let's think outside the box here like how do we change it you know how do we not have to rely on every dollar to you know, um, from developers to, to do these sorts of projects. I don't know. It's, it's sort of exciting. You know, I think communities were just ready to say we can do this too. Elisa's firm Rooted in Place has a small office in Ocean Beach. She only has one full-time staffer and makes a modest annual profit. But she says the firm has been keeping busy, completing several important projects like the transformation of a parking lot in National City into an outdoor classroom and community gathering space a revamp along Paradise Creek in National City, and other projects. So, Choyas Eco Village Project, is that, Mm -hmm. you're working on that currently? Working on that currently, yep. That's through Groundwork San Diego, where they received a grant to convert 50 homes into, um, 50 homes in the Encanto community um, uh, using gray water and uh, native planting. We also um, had... Uh, a couple more child development centers. Uh, two were with CDA, uh, Child Development Associates. One was in Park. Uh, one was in National City called uh, the Parks Child Development Center, which was a wonderful project that we did. We did a reading garden at the Finney Child Development Center, and that's in right on the border of Chula Vista and San Diego. We helped with the 50th and University um East African gathering place there. So they're still looking for funding for implementation, but we were able to do community workshops and come up with a design for them. We came up with a uh, nature learning area for um, Living Coast Discovery that they need to funding get funding for. We've been working with Leash Tag Foundation and Coastal Roots Farm, doing a children's farm 
educational farm uh, at the Coastal Roots Farm. And then we're working with Leash Tag and Oceanside Unified on converting the Pacifica school site up in Oceanside into an intergenerational community garden. So actually Mm. that was my community meeting last night. So that's really fun and exciting. A great project to be working on. Um, We've done some assistance on uh, a senior refugee garden in El Cajon. A, we did some work, a lot of work with Bayside. We've been working with Bayside on their One Linda Vista Gathering Place. We've done some work with them on uh, community garden expansion. Uh, what else was there? Uh, we were part of the first uh, intersection mural in uh, Linda Vista in front of Montgomery Middle School. We gave some guidance and worked a little bit with Barry Pollard on his 50th and Imperial project. Mm-hmm. Across the street from that, we worked with National Crossroads, which is a women's facility for uh, previously incarcerated and um, recently paroled women. And they wanted to, they have a sort of a blah outdoor space. And so we worked with them to come up with a design for a serenity garden, as well as a edible production garden on their um, small property uh, that they're looking to get funding for too. So a lot of work we do is to get a design, sometimes Mm. we'll call it a vision plan or um, just a schematic design that then these organizations can take to get funding because it's much easier to get funding when you have a plan. So maybe after I pitch you on this, you can tell me how often after people hear what you do, they do the same thing to you. Um, I live in Lemon Grove. There is this huge empty lot that I suspect is owned by Edco, the waste management giant, you know, huge corporation, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, which they have a facility right across the street. Um, Man, and I would just love like, Edco to help, you know, put maybe do like a little, maybe it is public land, I don't know, mm-hmm. but a public private partnership and turn that into like a cool little dump truck, gar- or sorry, garbage truck themed outdoor play area, right? Where there's lots Fun. of dirt. It'd be so dope. <laughs> <laughs> Ideas are spinning. Ideas yeah. Are spinning, so yes. does this happen to you a lot where like you start oh, yeah. telling people what they do and they're like, and then they start seeing the potential for all the, you know, for all these empty spaces, yeah. they just want to jackhammer asphalt away and mm-hmm. <laughs> get you in there. <laughs> and get Oh, yeah. So we, we get asked all the time. And as much as we want to do every project pro bono, obviously, like, we need to, you know, pay ourselves and, you know, <laughs> pay rent. <laughs> um, but, you know, we will do a consultation. And um, usually we, we do charge, you know, a very small fee for a consultation. And then if the organization hires us, that just rolls into the contract. Um, on occasion, if it's just really not possible and it's such an interesting project, you know, I'll make time to go out there. <laughs> and the first meeting is just brainstorming on, OK, how can we make this happen? Who are the people that need to be contacted? And just what we call in the pomegranate method train uh, po- pomegranate methodology, we call it wiring a project for success. And what are those first steps you need to get a project started um, in the right way that everyone feels that they're a part of it? Um, and that's that's usually how we get started. Elisa is also currently employed by the county where she works part time doing the same kind of community oriented design work she does with her landscape architecture firm. Another way Rooted in Place makes money is by offering community centered placemaking training workshops to other people. Elisa is currently partnered with the Bayside Community Center in Linda Vista, which wants to transform a parking lot into a gathering place. People can pay $450 for an eight-day training, which will be done in parallel with the build-out of the new community space for Bayside Community Center. So when we learn about how to run a community meeting, they can actually see it happen with the project. When we teach about how to do a steering group, they can actually, or a convening group, they can sit, they can observe how do we run a convening group. Oh, cool. How do we do early success projects? How do we coordinate for a build? And so the two... um, the two projects are going to parallel each other, the training with the project. And I think it's it's a really great model. And actually, we're working with USD and with Bayside to, we'd love to create a residency in Linda Vista for a couple years and then help them and help them, uh, their capacity, increase their capacity in their community. And then, I don't know, maybe in, maybe in two years, go to another community. Thanks for listening to I Made It in San Diego. I'm Kinsey Moreland. I wrote and produced this episode. Andrew Keats edited it and Adam Greenfield mastered and mixed it. Visit VoicesSanDiego.org slash podcast to learn more about our weekly Voice of San Diego political affairs show, our Good Schools for All education podcast, the Kept Faith sports podcast, 
Beer Talk Radio, and all the shows in the VOSD Podcast Network. If you like the show, go to VoicesSanDiego.org and click the donate button. Or if you'd like to sponsor it, contact development at VOSD.org.